Praise God. It feels like the atmosphere for some teaching tonight. Amen. I said, I said, teaching, not sleeping. <laughs> Betty's been yawning. 
that you got here. <laughs> Praise God. I mean, he's had a good week so far. Well, it has to be good. You, you're alive. Amen. Praise God. I tell you, Sunday, Sunday was just something special. <clears throat> I really see God moving in a lot of things. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we just, again, want to give you praise, give you honor. Lord, we just want to tell you that we love you. God, we have come together as a corporate body to learn from you tonight, to hear from you tonight. God, I pray that you would give us wisdom. pray that you would give us knowledge. And God, we pray that you would give us understanding. Lord, we need wisdom, we need knowledge, and we need understanding. We just want to worship you tonight. We just want to tell you that we love you and that we care about you. And God, that's why we're here. Lord, I pray that you would just continue to keep revival in our hearts. Lord, we're on fire for you, Lord. We're on fire for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen. Let me start off with a scripture tonight. <clears throat> a very important scripture. Uh, tonight's message is called sight and vision. How many know there's a difference between sight and vision? <clears throat> A lot of times we, um, our faith, and not necessarily you, but uh, many people, their faith is, can only go as far as their sight can go. Amen? Um, you know, I know there's a place called China. I know that. I can go all the way to the coast and I can look out across the ocean and I can see the horizon. That's about 30 miles whenever you're looking out over the ocean. You're seeing the horizon. It's 30 miles. That's as far as I can see. Now, if, if I only believed my sight, then I would say that's as far as it goes. And I would say the earth is flat, which they did at one point, right? But we know that it goes much further, amen? Uh, a whole lot further. You can keep traveling out to that horizon and beyond that horizon until all you see is a, a horizon of ocean on every single side. Amen? But we know that there's more. God wants us not to, Lord bless Miss Sarah. She's wanting a big reward. Look at that, two waters. <laughs> Double for her trouble. Um, if we could just get a hold of what the Word of God says and believe it, then no matter what we can see with our eyes, we would know that there's more than what we see. Amen? Let me give you this scripture. It's Proverbs 29, 18. Um, <clears throat> one of my favorite verses is in Proverbs, and uh, it's, no, excuse me, not Proverbs, um, Amos 4, 6, where it says, um, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. His people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. This right here says, Proverbs twenty nine eighteen says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. 
Where there is no vision, the people perish. Do you realize that the reason why people commit suicide is they believe that their temporary problems are permanent. They're temporary, but they believe they're permanent. If you can't see beyond the problems that you're facing and you think that that's where you're going to remain forever, it is easy to be discouraged. It is easy to get depressed. It is easy to just say, why try to continue on living if nothing is going to change? Amen? Where there is no vision, the people perish. Um, You know, the first time that you ever got the flu or you ever have been bedridden from sickness, if you didn't know what that sickness was and uh, you had never experienced it before and you had never seen somebody else experience it and see them get over it, you might give up and die. But because it don't matter how bad you feel because you hear a term used with that, flu, and because you've seen other people get the flu and you know they get better, it allows you to believe that you'll get better and to look beyond your sickness and say, I'm going to get better, I'm going to get past this. Amen? There are some people who they hear somebody tell them that, you know, this is a terminally ill disease and they, they just give up. And then there's other people that have heard that it's a terminally ill disease and they say, no, I am not dying. And they live on. Um, <clears throat> you know, for our sister Frida to, to hear what we were hearing in the beginning, it sounded like it was just all over. Amen? But if you went and talked to Frida, you didn't realize that she, she, was, she wasn't ready if she was going mean, to... She's got some fight in her. Amen? Um, <clears throat> she has vision. Where there is no vision, the people perish. When you don't have a vision for life, then you just kind of wander in life. And it doesn't matter where you go in life. It doesn't matter what you do every day. If you have no vision, if a church has no vision, that church will die. That church will have no leadership. Amen? It's vision that wakes us up. It's vision that keeps us going. It's vision that moves us past storms. The only reason why when you've been discouraged, even if you don't know exactly what God's calling is for your life, the only reason that keeps you coming to church and keeps you pushing forward and keep fighting is because you, somewhere in you, you believe that God is not through with you. You don't know what he wants to do with you yet. You don't know what he wants to bring out of you yet. You don't, you, you, sometimes you have self-doubts, but you believe somewhere down inside of you that God loves me and God does want to use me. Amen? Um, <clears throat> let me give you a couple of things real quick. Knowledge is information. Amen? Understanding is apprehension. I don't want just information. I want to understand information. Amen? Wisdom is application. Wisdom is knowledge, which is information, that you have apprehended, that you have understood, and that you have applied. Again, wisdom is knowledge or information that you have apprehended or understood and that you apply. If someone tells you, reading comes, you say, I want more faith, and you read in the Word, and it says, here's information. Here is, uh, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now, that's information. Now, if you just let that go in one ear and go out the other, you haven't apprehended that. How many know the devil is out to kill, steal, and destroy? And I want to put an emphasis on steal. The Bible says that uh, when, the, one, when the, uh, the sower went out to sow and seed fell in different places, there was one place it fell, and, the, and Jesus explained later that the, the wicked one himself cometh to steal what had tried to be sown. He is out to steal information from you. Come on. Man, I'm feeling the Holy Ghost. I don't know where this is coming from. 
Y'all ain't shouting loud, but I'm feeling it. Amen. Amen. This must be for somebody online. Um, <clears throat> the wicked one comes to steal that. Why? Because he doesn't want you to be equipped. Um, <clears throat> you know, whenever you are trying to figure out what your purpose is, when you begin to get a hint of what it is, and you begin to stand on it and say, you know what, I believe that God is calling me to do this work. You have to be tested on whether you are called for that. If you say, I, am, I know that God's going to use me for this, listen, life is going to test that word that you say. If you say, and I've done this, I know that God has called me to teach, that is going to be tested. I've had people test me on things and they don't even know it. I don't hold it against them. I, I look for it. That's why when people say stuff to me, because I've had people who are, listen, I started this when I was in my early 20s and well, really when I was a kid, uh, but I got away from the, uh, from the Lord when I was 13 all the way until I was 19 and I turned back to God. But even since those days, I've had people, when I begin to talk about the Bible, they just look at you and say, well, you're... You're young, and they don't want to learn from you. I'm much wiser than you. I'm much older than you. Listen, I know that you are, but can you believe that God may be able to give something inside of me that can help you? Amen. Tyler surprises me with stuff. I listen to him. He'll ask me questions about things that I've never thought of. I, I, I never reject where God may be able to speak to me by. Amen. If he can speak to a man by the way of a donkey, I look for wisdom and knowledge in every avenue that he wants to bring it to me. Amen. So the enemy is out to steal information from you. He wants you not to apprehend it. How many know you got to grab a hold of knowledge? Huh? You got to grab a hold of it. I... I can't just read in this Bible and say, all right, I've read my Bible, I've read my chapter. I've got to get in it and I have to think about every word that I'm reading. I can't just read it just to be reading. I read it and I'm thinking as I'm reading. I can read it through that and be thinking about everything else. But to really try to apprehend what I'm reading, I've got to think about the word and let it settle. And sometimes because... I have the superpower of ADHD. My mind wants to focus on a lot of other things, but I have to focus and say, I am going to get this. Amen? I have to apprehend the knowledge. The enemy wants that information to go in one ear. All right? I want, I want faith, you say. I want faith. I want faith. I want to have more faith. You read, you get it, God puts information in front of you. Faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God. And it goes in one ear and out the other. You didn't apprehend it. But if you apprehend it, if you grab a hold of it and say, faith cometh by hearing. So I need to hear something to have faith. And hearing by the word of God, I need to hear the word of God. And now you have understood that if I want to have faith, I've got to read the word of God. Amen. Now I want to have wisdom. A lot of people grab a hold of information. They hear it. They apprehend it. They understand it, but they never have wisdom because they never apply it. Why? Sometimes they doubt what they understand. Sometimes they doubt whether that information is for them. Sometimes they they maybe lean to their own understanding. That's why the Bible says, look, you can understand some things and maybe you, the way that you think is, is right, but it might not be right. That's why we have to make sure that we get in the word and study the word and we have to pray and we have to fast and we have to seek God and we have to look at a verse in the context of the whole Bible. That's why I've got to read that word over and over and over. God has given me an understanding of the word because I've applied it and I've read it many, many times. I read it every single year. And so it becomes more and more a part of my life because I've made it a part of my life. Amen. So wisdom comes when you say, all right, I heard faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
So I understand that I need to read the Word of God in order for my faith to increase. Now I have to apply it. How do I apply it? Well, wisdom is setting up a schedule to read. Wisdom is setting up, setting aside time and saying, no matter what, I want faith. Now, I'm going to use some wisdom here. I know I need the Word of God, and I better be reading this thing every day, and I better not be waiting for the pastor to read it to me on Sunday or Wednesday. I need to get into that Word myself. Amen? Amen? I tell you what, y'all are good students because I see people writing notes. I, I, I love that. Do you know what? I, I want you to challenge everything you ever hear me talk about. Because if you just do what I'm saying, you're in danger. Why? Because if you have that practice and you ever go to some other conference and you just write down what they say and believe it as fact, they could be leading you into error. You need to say, all right, I'm going to challenge this. I'm going to find it in the Bible myself. If this is really the Holy Ghost, my spirit will bear witness with his spirit. Amen. How many has ever been led astray? There's a lot of leader astrayers. <laughs> Amen. So knowledge is information. Understanding is apprehension. Wisdom is application. Let me give you this example. How many know Jesus loves you? How many know Jesus knew he loved you? Jesus could have. He could have said, I love you. And you could have still went to hell. But he applied what he believed and he died for you come on Jesus applied what he believed and he died for you some people will have give you knowledge and they'll say I'll die for you I would die for you and then somebody will shoot and then they dump behind you Now, they're not applying what they say, <laughs> what their information is saying. Amen? But Jesus applied what he said. The Bible says, before the foundation of the world, he was slain for you. That's love. And then he followed through with it. Amen? That's real love. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to skip this next uh, this next verse here, I don't think I, I, I need it for this. Um, well, let me go ahead and go over it. John sixteen twelve. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How many know that where you are mentally, where you are spiritually, can determine what God gives you, what God can teach you? How many wants God to be able to just unfold things to you? There are some people in here that uh, in watching the internet that may say, I am ready to see angels. You haven't seen any, and God is saying, look, if you've seen them, you'd have a heart attack. There are some who have, Say, I am ready to have a crusade and just have thousands of people and just lead a crusade. And God says, you don't have the character for it yet. There are teachings, and I've had it, I have had it in this very church where the Holy Ghost has given me things and he's telling me to write them down. And I've had to halt myself from speaking them because he's let me know that you're not ready yet. How many of you have ever been witnessing to somebody and you knew God give you wisdom? Just leave that alone. They're not ready. It doesn't speak anything bad about a person. I'm not going to go to a kindergarten class and teach calculus. Amen? It would just go whoosh, over the head, right? Jesus said the same thing. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. 
This is why I study so much because I want to be ready for any time in my life for him to be able to give me information, to be able to give me knowledge. And I want to have the understanding. I want to be built up. I want to have have studied to show myself approved so he can use me. Some of the things that we have been doing here lately in this church, what God is doing, like the, 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 the Sunday night with the blocks being removed, there's things that God is working on us. Why? He is preparing us for something. He is preparing something for us that is going to be great. I know by the Holy Ghost that is just working in me right this very second that there are going to be people in this Oh, man, in this very church that are going to be on the outside just watching, saying, well, I don't know if it really is. But I know there are people looking for it. They are wanting it. I have seen Ruth several services. She gets down in that seat and she's praying. There is a hunger in this church for more God. And then there are some people who just... When this thing explodes, they are going to be looking for extra credit. (laughs) They are going to be looking for overtime because they want to get in the midst of what they should have got in a long time ago so they'll be ready when God breaks loose. I don't want to miss it. Amen? Have you ever come and you ever got late to a service, got there late, and you had to catch up? You come in and they are just exploded in the spirit and you're just like, oh gosh, what have I missed? Praise God, hallelujah, Lord, let me get in, let me jump in. How can I get in? Amen? It's like seeing some people pl- play double dutch and they're doing the jump rope and you're, you're just trying to figure out how, how can I get in that thing and begin to jump. You don't want to get hit by that rope. You want to get right in the midst of it. Listen, I want to be a part of what God is doing right now while it is a quiet, quiet storm. Seeking him, worshiping him. Because when this thing explodes, it's going to happen fast. How many believe that? I believe it. I want to talk about vision because... I believe that revival comes and it ain't just for the shout. It's not just for a story. It's to ignite people. It begins to bring people in. It begins to unlock things in people. God has a purpose. You know, some people, if you just uh, watch revivals on TV, somebody sees people just running around and shouting, Uh, There are a lot of denominations that may not understand it. But if they realize that God is doing something and unlocking some things in people, they would want to be as much a part of it as they could so that they could have some things unlocked. Amen? Um, God associates himself with two animals, animals quite frequently in the Bible. One is a lion, and what's the other? An eagle. An eagle. Um, Some interesting things about an eagle, and we've discussed a few of these before, but an eagle has eyes like you wouldn't believe. They can see up to five miles away in great detail. If when I'm up in a plane and I'm up about five miles, um, I can't tell a whole lot of what on the ground. Anytime we fly over the ocean, I'm trying to notice swells in the ocean. And I, I, I can't recognize swells. Uh, just the, the water. I, I look at places where it's white and I think, is that a white cap of a wave? But it never changes. I say, I don't know what that is. It just all looks the same, doesn't it? I try to look down at that height of five miles up and I try to see if I can see 
sharks or whales or anything. I can't see a thing. Have you done that before? I don't see anything. I got an awesome camera and I'll zoom in and I'll zoom all the way down and even that camera cannot get the detail that I need to be able to see very clearly on that ocean. It's just all pixelated once you zoom in that much. But an eagle can fly higher than any other animal, any other bird, and it can see more clearly than any other bird. It can fly higher than any other bird. Um, An eagle does something that other birds don't do. Whenever there's a storm, whenever there's a storm coming, have you ever noticed a bird, just birds begin to fly away from it? Eagles are very different. An eagle will fly towards the storm and it'll tilt its wings and it will ride the storm up above the storm. And when it is in top flight, it's above the storm and it won't see any other birds except another eagle. So if you are facing storms, realize that God associates himself with eagles. Eagles let storms push them higher. So storms, if you're supposed to be like your father who associates himself with eagles and you're supposed to be like him, then if storms come, you need to let those storms push you higher because God is trying to get you in a position so that you can see vision. Y'all should be excited about that. God uses these things to reveal vision to you. There are people that are going to come in this thing, into this revival, in order to see for the first time. I'm not talking about eyesight. In order to see purpose, in order to get ignited, something get on fire inside of them. Amen. Write this down, if you will. Your eyes always show you what is. Your eyes always show you what is. But vision shows you what could be. Vision shows you what could be. Vision is our greatest source of hope. Vision is our greatest source of hope. How do I know that? Has anybody ever seen heaven? Huh? Anybody ever had a dream about heaven? I know John did. So nobody's seen it. But do you believe there's a heaven? When I read about those streets of gold, about the crystal sea, about the pearly gates about the gates with the the 12 different stones that are around the gate. When When I read about the throne of God, when I read about the tree of life, when I read about the river that flows from the throne of God in between the trees of life when I read about those things when I read about it I it it gives me vision God gave us vision for what heaven looks like and yet still the eye hath not seen but that vision rested on our hearts didn't it sometimes it gets so strong in people that they begin to long to go to that place instead of being here amen uh I long to see and I believe that the meek shall inherit the earth. It is hard when we look at all the things going on this earth to realize that heaven, earth is going to look just like heaven. But according to the Bible, it is. I just imagine, and this is how real heaven is. And see, this is vision. How many of you have ever thought about being in heaven? How many of you have ever thought about being on earth after everything is over? The Bible says that you'll be able to look up and see heaven. I believe we'll be able to travel in between them just at the speed of thought. But it'll be hard to tell one place from another. 
Because God's desire is that it be just like heaven here. You will have better vision than an eagle has. <laughs> Can you imagine being able to stand in the New Jerusalem city and just walk around and look up and see? I mean, I don't know if it will be just like a river or if it'll be a long waterfall. The Bible says that there'll be a river flowing from the throne of God. But you'll be able to see it. I'm going to come up to each and every one of you. This isn't anybody on camera because I don't, I don't know who you are right now. But everybody that is in here, Lord, let me remember. I'm going to come up. I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to grab Betty. I'm going to grab Betty and I'm going to say, Betty, look, there's heaven. <laughs> I'm talking about after we come back. I'm going to come up to Paula. I'm going to say, Paula, look. Do you remember that message when I was preaching? I told you I was going to come up to you and I was going to say, look, there's heaven. Well, there it is. Do y'all feel that? You have a vision for that. You, but why? Because God has shown you in his word what he has prepared for them that love him and you believe what he said. And it don't matter how bad things get here, your hope. The greatest source of hope is vision. God has given you a vision for a better day. He's given you a vision for the future. He's given you a vision for an expected end. So you read it, you believe it, and it don't matter how bad things get, you say, you know what? All of this is going to change one day. God is wanting to give you vision now for your life now. Amen? Why? Because... In, let me read this next scripture. Let me get to this scripture and then we'll, we'll uh, um, <clears throat> I'm going to skip ahead right here and I'm going to come back to this because I want to get this scripture down. Psalm 37, 4. We love you guys. Psalm 37, 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of what? Thine heart. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Now, there's two things that I get from this. I know that God cares about things that we desire. Amen. But there's another part of this that I think that we miss sometimes. He would have your soul. He would have you prosper even as your soul prospers. Amen. He's got a purpose for your life. You were created for his workmanship. You were created for good works. Amen. When you begin to fulfill purpose and you fulfill what it is that God called you to do and you fulfill what are, the reason, the reason for you being here, guess what? You will be happy. Amen. That is where the greatest source of your joy will be is knowing I am fulfilling what he has called me to do. Amen. Amen. This right here, he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Sometimes we think we are seeking for God to give us something to do. God, give me something to do. I just Like God is up there saying, all right, I have a certain number of assignments and when you finally get close enough, I'm gonna give you one of these assignments. No, he didn't do that. Trapped on the inside of you is his purpose for you. You're not asking God to give you an assignment. He's already given you an assignment. You are not asking God to give you a purpose. The fact that you are alive and on this earth means you already have one. The thing that you're really searching for is for God to reveal what he trapped on the inside of you before you were ever born. Is that deep? Who you are, who you're supposed to be, every bit of potential, your purpose, your calling, everything is already inside of you. The Bible says to stir up the, the gift of God that's inside of you. 
It's already there. It's just sediment right now. <laughs> it's got to be stirred up off the floor of your spirit because God's put it there. So you're not having to seek for an assignment. You're seeking for God to reveal what he's already put there for you to do. You're not seeking. See, sometimes we think, well, there's so many people busy doing things and I've got to find something new. I got, no, listen, what God wants you to do, you can do better than anybody else. Why? Because he engineered you exactly the way he wants you to operate. People sometimes want to be Benny Hinn. You can't be Benny Hinn. Benny Hinn is Benny Hinn. That's what he was called to do. Unless God tells me to throw my coat on somebody, I'm going to keep my coat on. Could God do that? Absolutely. If God told me to take my pants off and throw them at somebody, I'd drip them off and throw them. I'm going to listen to what God says for me to do. Amen. Lord, don't tell me to do that, please. (laughs) But whatever God tells you to do, you need to do it. I don't have to mimic anybody. There's somebody that I'm called to be. Amen? Look at this. Romans eleven twenty nine. 29. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. The gifts and the calling. Everybody say that. The calling of God. How many know that you were called? The calling of God. You cannot change the calling of God for your life. It's irrevocable. I got to say that again. I'm feeling that. The calling of God on your life is irrevocable. Oh, can you handle this? Even God cannot change it. Why? He put it there. He said it. He planted it. God, when God makes his mind up about something, listen, you don't have to second guess God. You realize that when you begin to doubt yourself, you're really doubting what God put on. I don't know if I can do this. You are doubting what God has put on the inside of you. His calling is irrevocable. People try to run from it, don't they? They will try to run from the calling of God and they'll try to do all kinds of other things And God will just lasso them back in because God's saying, look, you ain't doing that. My calling is irrevocable. I've done said what you're going to be. Let me go back to this scripture I wanted to read you right here. Ecclesiastes 11, 1 through 6. Is this good? Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Give a portion to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. I know that's really small, I apologize. <clears throat> Sometimes we we are just saving up ourselves for some specific time to begin to operate for some specific time to give, for some specific time to try to be used by God. And God's saying, look, you just need to be working, casting it out, giving your portion, giving yourself to people to help people. Your calling, your purpose is for other people. It's not even for you. Sometimes we are holding things in until we die. And guess what? We leave with it. Jeanette said something up here Sunday night that it was... I am just in complete agreement with. She said when she leaves here, she doesn't want to leave without having finished everything she was supposed to do. That reminds me of that song that I sang a couple of weeks ago, Don't Let Me Leave Behind an Unfinished Task. I want to finish everything that he wants me to do. Amen? What if Jesus had come here raised the dead, healed the sick, just touched all of those people, made people walk, did all the, fed people, did all those miracles, but then he didn't die on the cross. 
Did he do good things? Yes. But the most important thing was left undone. Some of us would be happy doing all those miracles, but missing the most important thing. Have you finished your most important assignment? We're still here. I believe that once we're finished with what we're supposed to do, we're free to leave. In fact, when Jesus was done, his last words on the cross were, it is finished. That's what I want. I want to, when I leave in my time, I want to be able to say, oh, it's finished. I, I'm done. I've done what I'm supposed to do. If the clouds be full of rain, what? They empty themselves upon the earth. Why? The clouds are holding rain. They're supposed to shower down. There are things that you're supposed to do, but you're looking for the right place to rain on. But this says, if the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. He that observeth the wind shall not sow. And he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. If you lived on your, for your garden and you just waited for just the perfect time to sow, oh, the wind's not right, it's raining, it would take you forever to get that stuff in the ground. And then if you waited for the perfect time to harvest, look, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. If you're gonna eat, you got to reap, amen? There were many days when my grandfather said, we're going to go out and, and pick corn, and we had to pick the corn, and we would bring it out to the edge where our driveway was. We had this long gravel driveway, and there were days where I didn't want to go out there because it was hot. Now, if I had let that temperature keep me from going out there, now, I would have got a belt, but... <laughs> or a switch but if I had let it keep me from doing it if, if my grandfather had let the heat keep him from doing it we wouldn't have had corn that night and we would bring that corn out and we would bring it to the side and there was these little row of trees and we'd get right under them trees and we would shuck the corn and break them little ends off of there and get all them little strings off of there and we would pick green beans and I'd have to sit there and string them you know you pull them strings off and then snap them two places pop, pop, and they'd snap I, 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 this is how I grew up. I grew up on a farm. My grandfather had two farms, two, uh, two, uh, yeah, two places where he farmed. He had fruits in one, had vegetables in the other. Uh, I mean, they were, it was healthy, healthy food. We would go and get worms early in the morning and we would fish later. We would, I'd go out to the chicken coop and I'd, I learned after a while because one time I opened it up there was a snake in there. And so I'd get a stick and I'd pull it open with a stick and I'd see if there's a snake and if it was, I'd knock it out of there and kill it. I killed, I don't know how many copperheads growing up. It was just a normal thing for me as a child. And I'm talking, I was between the ages of seven and 11. It was just normal for me to kill snakes. I, I, I knew what copperheads looked like and I stayed away from them. And uh, <clears throat> so I'd get those eggs out of there and I remember getting a chicken and my papa wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't uh, turn their necks. He thought that was cruel. He'd just cut the head off. And then grandma would put it in hot water and she'd pluck them feathers off of there. <clears throat> And we would go and fish. I mean, this was good food. No, there was no, my grandfather didn't put hormones in none of this stuff. It was good food. It was good, amen? I miss that food. I miss the taste of the, the putting my labor into growing what I'm going to eat. There's nothing like it, is it, Ronnie? Knowing that I, this thing started as a seed and I got it. He that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. There's a lot of people wanting to reap purpose out of their life and feel fulfilled, but they have never sown because they're looking for the right place to sow, looking for the right place to begin working. When God is saying, don't observe the clouds, don't observe the wind, just work, just be busy. Don't worry about whether you're doing exactly in the exact area I want you. I'm going to guide you. Just be busy working. Sometimes we are so busy trying to look, but we never act. I asked Roy one time, I said, 
How do you know whether you're supposed to go here? Because I know they've been to Cuba, been to England, been to all these places. How, how are you supposed to know that, you know, this is where I'm supposed to go? And he said, well, you just, you got to just push on the door. If it opens, go. If it doesn't, try door number two. <laughs> That's what he said. And I, 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 I understood that. That made sense. Because sometimes we're just sitting there just looking. And we're asking for God, God, lay out a gold road to the door I'm supposed to take. And God is saying, look, you just need to trust me and show some faith and begin to knock on doors and begin to push open doors. Don't be afraid to try, amen? If I waited for God to just tell me, hey, this is right, then there are some people that I may have not ever ministered to. Now, I'm going to use wisdom. I'm not going to go up to some people that I think are completely rebellious unless he gives me wisdom about it. But sometimes I'm just thinking, well, somebody else will touch them. And, and God, I, I, you, look, I'm just looking. I, I, I'm working. I'm, I try to strike up a conversation with people all the time about the Lord, even at my job. There are people that are... Um, <clears throat> in other religions that I have discussed things with. And had I had been aware, it may have made me thought twice, but because I struck up a conversation with them and began to talk about it, I began to find out who they are and I, I learned how I could talk to them even if they were of another religion. Sometimes we're afraid to talk to people because we're afraid, what are they going to think about me? As thou knowest not, what is the way of the spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. In the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thine hand, for thou knowest not whether shall prosper either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. You know what this means? Like, uh, I, I used to, for a while, I used to go and sing at a, the, the nursing home. Now, I would do that in the afternoon after working all day. Now, according to the scripture, I, I, I did both. I worked during the day, and then I'd go and I'd sing at night. Now, I don't sing at night at this nursing home anymore. I just, what I felt that I needed to do, I felt like it was done. But sometimes we get so busy doing something during the day and at night we have energy to do something, whether it's studying, whether it's planning, whether it's drawing out plans, whether it's figuring out a, 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 a way of a business. Man, I'm feeling something strong right here. I, I don't know, somebody's needing this. I, I can't just work during the day and be busy during the day and then just rest at night. I, if, if I have the energy, I need to spend time on both. Why? Because the Bible says you don't know which one will prosper you. Do you know why we get discouraged when we go to a job and we get dis disappointed and we just get disillusioned by a job? It's because it's not our permanent position. Some people stay at a job their entire life for a paycheck and they're discouraged and they're not getting fulfillment and they're wondering why they feel that way. It's because God is trying to tell them, this is not my final place for you. But unless you do something in the evening, like the Bible says, in the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thine hand, for thou knowest not whether which shall prosper, either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. You've got to be busy both during the day and during the night because you don't know what God's wanting to do. Do you see what I'm saying? You've got to be working and trying some things and God, let God show you which one that he wants you to do. This is why we have so much frustration on a job and we get so frustrated when we're there and when we have to go in. It's because it's not where we're supposed to be permanently. You may be there for a little while and you learn. God teaches you in those places, but it's not your fulf the fulfillment of your calling. Do you all understand? I've had God open up a lot of doors and I'm always looking when these doors open <clears throat> and saying, Lord, I'm going to go into this. I, I'm not going to say that this is permanent because maybe this is just a training exercise. Maybe I'll be deployed in this for a little while, but it's not permanent. I love 
doing hosting nightline, but I'm not going to set my sight as, oh, this is what God's going to have me to do because it might not be. He could change it at any time. But why? Because he might want me to be busy doing something else. That's why when something closes, when a door closes, I don't get angry. I just realize that that part is over. I don't want to be somewhere that God doesn't want me to be. I want to be right where he wants me. Amen? I've read this one. I've read this one. Let me get to this. Ephesians 2. This, you know, what God is doing in these services is so important because, you know, God is, he is a master planner. A master planner. You know, sometimes we think we're the center of the universe. (laughs) We think that what we're doing may be the most important. And there's, uh, it's normal for us to have a, uh, uh, a sense of joy or, uh, or pride in what we're doing. It's what makes you do such a good job because you think it's important. And it's important to God. But God has such a big picture that he's working on. Amen? If, if it wasn't for God making singing important to one and music important to one and teaching important to another and uh, the sound important to another and, and fellowship important to another and prayer important to another, you wouldn't have everything that there needs to be. But God is working on so many things at one time. He's trying to get us all in one accord, in one place, working together for the same goal. What keeps churches from growing is the culture of the church when some people are afraid somebody's going to get something over on them and they create an environment where everybody can't grow because they're worried what somebody else is getting over them. God doesn't want that. He wants us to realize that we're all one family, one blood, working for the same thing, his kingdom, what God has in mind. Because God can do exceedingly abundantly above anything we can ask or think, and he has a plan. He's got a purpose. And so if we just listen to him and let God use us and, and, and don't have contention or don't have strife or, and we lift one another up and encourage one another, we'll begin to see vision in our own life. It'll be individual vision for your life. And guess what happens? When every one of us have individual vision, it begins to work together as corporate vision for some big goal that God's going to bring out. Look at this. For through him, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are what? Fellow citizens, not just citizens, we're fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building, everybody say whole building, being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Everybody say, God has a plan. Say, God has a plan for my life. I point to somebody and say, God has a plan for your life. God has a plan for our life. God's got a plan for what he's doing together. Amen? There is just, whenever I think, you know, Anytime I'm ever around a fire, sitting around a fire with people, it it is one of the most intimate places that I can be with people, just talking around a fire. I don't know what it is about a fire. I just love sitting around a campfire. It could be a bonfire. It could be a fireplace and just talking. And that camaraderie that you have, that closeness that you have with people, I always think about Jesus when he was around his disciples, breaking the bread, passing the cup, just that closeness. They, they remembered that because they even said, you remember how our hearts burned within us? 
it burned with purpose, it burned with passion, it burned knowing I am a part of something that is so much bigger than I am and I know I'm working, I am one with all of these people, these people are my brothers, they are my sisters. Oh man, I love working for God, amen. Will y'all stand with me? We want to thank you guys for watching us on the internet. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, listen, before you worry about your calling, your purpose, you need to meet your Lord once again and be reconciled to the Father. He's got a purpose for you. It's planted. It's on the inside of you. But the key to untapping that seed that he's placed inside of you is you first have to come to know the Lord. I pray that you will pray this prayer right now so that that seed can get in the right environment and it can begin to grow. It can begin to flourish. It can begin to grow. And it can be, begin to minister and help and deliver something to all of his saints, all the body of Christ. There is, I believe there is something on the inside of every person on this earth that is meant to be a benefit to others. I pray this message has been a benefit to you and I pray that you will begin to let God just ignite a fire inside of you and to come back to him right now. You just need to pray this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner and I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that you died on the cross and you shed your blood because you were applying what you believed, that you loved us, you were applying what you had started in order to reconcile us back to you. You died for our sins. You shed your blood and you showed us you loved us because no greater love can anyone show than to die for their friends. So Lord, I just want to tell you that I believe what you did was for me, for the remission of my sins and I accept it. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And I acknowledge and confess that you, Jesus, from this day forward, you're my Lord. Come into my heart. Change me. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, please go to lmcigreenville.org. Click contact at the top and let us know. God bless you. Ronnie, we get a song ready. I'm going to pray over you. And